The Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast is made possible in part by a generous gift from Set Apart to Serve, the church work recruitment initiative of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Many church workers always knew they wanted to serve in Christ's church, but many pastors, teachers, and other full-time church workers left careers to pursue this life of service. If you or a friend have been praying and thinking about a second career as a church worker, the Set Apart to Serve team wants to help. Visit kfuo.org slash SAS to learn more. Listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. And I'm Rachel. Today we get to start a new series. This is one of the new things that we're trying out as we come back into new programming and bring you some new content. We're going to have a new series of episodes for about the next year and a half because I'm in a master's program. And I know this is very exciting. Squealing. We're so excited. <laughs> you were talking about this for so long. And then when you finally yeah. did it, we were so it's proud of you scary. and excited for you. Yeah. And yeah, tell us, tell them all about it. I know about it. I know. So this new series, I figured while I'm in school and learning things that are applicable to me and my own vocations, why not share with you guys and our Lutheran ladies in general, some stuff that I'm learning that is applicable to everybody because I'm doing my master's in organizational leadership, and I'm doing that through Concordia Irvine. And this program is very much based on people and learning about people, learning about character and how we interact with everybody. It's a lot of psychology and all of this stuff I'm learning is really applicable to like everybody. Not all of it. Like I'm sure learning about company culture is probably going to be a thing that we might just breeze past. But (laughs) learning about things like character development and how we relate to each other in relationships and integrity in our relationships. That stuff is useful for probably most everyone. So this is a new series called Sarah Goes to School. I am in school for the next year and a half. So every few months or so, I'm just going to like pull together some of the things I've learned in my classes and talk about it with you guys because I'm really jazzed about learning all of this stuff. And it's been, I'm barely into my second class, which is really my first seven week class so like I am I'm just scraping the surface of like just a few weeks of things that I've learned but it's it's been really really interesting so I'm I'm really excited I'm (laughs) so glad that we're doing this series because when you said you were going back to school I was a little jealous oh but then when you said but it's okay I'll share with you everything I'm learning and you can look (laughs) over my shoulder then I I felt much better so I'm glad we get to do this for the listeners too Yes, and hopefully it's food for thought in your own vocations as you serve. I know a lot of the ladies that listen serve, I mean, in family, and this has a lot of implications just for family relationships. A lot of women that listen serve in the church or in other vocations. So hopefully this is something interesting. And if anybody has questions about anything regarding leadership, I mean, I, I'm happy to pull in comments from people too, if anybody has things that they want me to talk about or think about for them or whatever. So this is a This is an open conversation with everyone. So why did I pick this degree first off? Like Rachel said, I've, gosh, I've been looking for a master's degree since I graduated undergrad. That has like been a bucket list item for me for 13 years. I love school. And so I wanted to do something, but I love a lot of things as most of you probably know. And so like my, my, my interests are very wide and, but I didn't really want to specialize in any of them. And plus my undergrad degrees don't completely relate to what I'm doing now. So like I don't have this continuity of education to build off of. Mm -hmm. And so I know there was an episode a while ago that I was like, I'm going to do my degree in theology. And that's still kind of on the back burner of doing deaconess stuff. I haven't completely gotten rid of that. It just now wasn't the right time for that for some reasons that I won't go into. But I started going to therapy several months ago, and that was actually the key to where I am now. Because going to therapy made me think through a lot of stuff and think through a lot of just the stuff that I'm doing now in my vocations. And I realized that I was holding on to something that I thought I wanted for myself, but it wasn't actually practical for what I'm doing now. And then I randomly ran across, well, I was actually, okay, so I was looking at the theology master's 
at Concordia Irvine and randomly ran across their organizational leadership program. And my brain went, yes, this is what you've been looking for. <laughs> so it was, it was very accidental that I even found it. But then I started reading through the courses and I like love every single one of the course descriptions, which I was not expecting in a master's program. Okay. So I was like, okay, I guess this is what I'm doing. And then I applied in October to start in August. And they were like, are you sure you're going to wait like nine months to start this program? Like, you sure you don't want to start like now? I was like, no, I really can't because like Easter and Lent and LWML this summer and Mm -hmm. I can't. So it took me a long time to finally start, but I'm in it now and I'm super duper excited. A lot of people have asked me like, oh, are you going to change careers now? And I'm like, no, no. This is, I love what I do with you guys. I love everything we do with the Ladies Lounge. I love what I do with KFUO. So this is like another step in branching out into better relationships with people and just doing my vocations even better. So I've also learned that this type of master's is perfect for somebody who likes a lot of stuff because it's applicable in so many different areas of life. Mm -hmm. So it's been interesting in my cohort, all of us do different things. And yet the stuff that we're learning makes sense for all of us in different ways. And so we're learning from each other too and from different industries and different backgrounds. All of these different things that we're learning, they apply across everybody. And so I chose Irvine also because part of my master's list bucket was to go to an exotic school. (laughs) This is becoming a more specific bucket list item than I was expecting. (laughs) I don't think I really realized that, but okay, because I've gone to Lutheran schools my whole life and I love Lutheran schools and I wasn't totally expecting to go to another Lutheran school for my master's, but I have been looking at like all of these really prestigious universities and all these exotic places in the United States, I think. And But Irvine actually checks that off the list because it's California. And so I got to go to California for a four-day residency program that they do at the beginning of the master's. And I was like, yes, this is absolutely perfect. I got to go to the beach. I was in... Southern California. And I was like, this this is perfect. It checks that that box of like an exotic institution, even though it's still a Concordia. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's that. But seriously, I looked at this program and I looked at other programs and there's a lot of leadership programs out there, like a bazillion of them. And a, the ones that the other ones that I looked at, they're very business focused and that's fine. They're like masters of science. So you're going to really get into like analytics and all of this other stuff that are great. And I'll learn some of that too. But I'm really more of a like people person and really understanding how people function together. That's really what I'm looking forward to in this program because the leadership is housed with their counseling in their the Townsend Institute. Oh, wow. And so there's a lot of overlap between counseling and psychology sociology with this leadership program, which really sets it apart from anything else. And I mean, they they said that before I went there and then I went there and experienced the people and the residency that they put on. And I was like, OK, yeah, I believe it because mm. it, it really is a, a very different feel. Like they really want you to understand who you are so that you can serve people better. And that's totally my jam. So okay. definitely worth it. And the residency is a very interesting thing. A lot of online master's degrees don't really do anything in person, especially like business style masters, but they're very intentional about bringing people together to learn from each other. And they said it was going to be a transformational experience and like this, this crazy thing. And I don't always believe people when they say that. They're like, (laughs) it's going to be great. And I'm like, I don't know that I believe you yet. But, (laughs) but when I went there, it really was a an amazing thing. And this gives me a lot of perspective for online education. It's such a thing now, especially post-pandemic, right? Like everybody's doing education online. And it's awesome that we can connect online. But having that experience of meeting my cohort and really getting to know each other in person really, really well on a really deep level before we go back to all of our computers and, and work online, it's really been amazing. We had our first virtual class um, just this week, actually. And all of us were like, I'm so happy to see your faces. And I told them, I was like, I don't mind being my weird self now because you all actually know me and <laughs> I actually think I'm like that weird of a person. So I know I can be myself in a virtual class because I've had that experience with everybody. It makes so much difference. Yeah. I'm really thrilled with this already. Sorry, this was not meant to be like a huge commercial for Concordia Irvine, <laughs> if that's what it's turning out to be. <laughs> I'm really happy with this program. I'm glad I chose it for myself. So I don't really want to lecture you guys for an hour. That is not the point of all of this. And I I doubt this will even be an hour. We'll see what happens. And I'm not going to just like regurgitate what I'm learning in class because I don't think that's really helpful for you guys either. What I want to do is just boil down and kind of translate 
what I'm learning that's helpful for other Lutheran women, and I know not all of it will translate, and that's fine. The first thing that we all got to learn was relationships, building on relationships. What does it mean to actually be in relationship with people? What does it mean for us to have needs as people? And that makes us kind of uncomfortable to ask people that we need something. But it's really, really important for us to like actually understand the needs that we have, like emotional needs that we have in order for us to ask other people and be comfortable asking other people to meet those needs for us. And that's Mm -hmm. in families and in our work life and in our friend life. Like if, if I'm really in need of some empathy from somebody and I recognize that in myself, who can I go to that I can say that to somebody and they're going to accept that and give me that empathy that I need so that I can move on with my day? Something like that. We also talked about the fact that we are all children of God. We're all made in God's image and we are important people to him. We matter as individuals, as human beings, and that's a great starting point for anything that you're here for a purpose and that purpose is important and God cares about that. And so we can serve other people knowing that we are made in the image of God and that we are here, right? Love God and serve your neighbor. That's kind of what it Mm -hmm. all ended up boiling down to. So in our vocations, like those things really do matter what we're doing, even if even if you don't think it's that important. Like if you're a stay-at-home mom, that is super important and that vocation matters to the people around you in a huge way, even if Maybe the world doesn't think so. Like, it really does matter. So that kind of stuff, like, you have influence on other people. Even if you think your circles are small, you still have a whole lot of influence on other people. So we have this, this Townsend growth model was like the one thing that we have been digging into so much in the last couple of weeks. This is kind of what everything is based on. And so it's basically a tree and you've got the soil that is grace and truth and time. And then this Mm. trunk is your character, the stuff that builds out of the grace and truth and time. I'll get to that in a second. And then the fruit is all of the stuff that you see in like your personal life, your people relationships and your performance like at work. And so basically you have the soil of grace and truth over time. And then those things help you build the strong character And then you're going to be able to produce healthy fruit in your personal and people and performance areas of your life. And in that soil, we have what Dr. Townsend calls these relational nutrients. I love that. There's this grace, grace, truth, and time. I'm going to remember that. Yes. It's very helpful. So we've got these relational nutrients that are in the soil that kind of help your character grow strong so that you can serve other people well. And I'm not going to go over all of them. There's like 22 of them. But well, so grace, truth and time are not the nutrients. No, but they are what the okay. what what the soil is. And oh, then you've okay. got these these okay. nutrients that are helping to feed all of this. Okay. And these nutrients yeah. are like what our relationships, like these interactions are based off of. So we've got different four different groups of these nutrients that we give back and forth to each other. Mm-hmm. And so like Q1, these Q1 nutrients, these are, <laughs> these are <laughs> this first group is like the, the nutrients of being present with people. So these are things like when you tell somebody something really hard and the other person just like sits there with you and is like, mm. I hear you, I get it. And that's it. Like the presence that you feel. Mm -hmm. When you're with somebody and you know that they're physically there for you. Mm -hmm. So these are like acceptance, attunement, or you're just like tuning into that other person's need, validation of like, yeah, that what you're feeling is a valid thing to be feeling. Identification, like, yeah, I've I've felt that too. What you're going through is not weird or unusual. Like I I get it. Containment, I love this one. So containment is like, Is this the ability for you to like hold on to somebody's emotional stuff without taking it on yourself, Mm. if that makes sense? So like if Rachel comes and vents to me about something terrible, Mm -hmm. I have the capacity to hold on to that and to like hear you and sit there with you in it, but not think that it's mine or that I have to fix it for you. I'm able. That's a hard skill to learn. (laughs) Yes. But it's it's such a cool one to think about because we do this a lot. Like we go to somebody and we're like, I need to just get this off my chest. 
I feel like we usually do that with people that we know will listen to it and Mm -hmm. be there and like give you a hug, but like not break down and be like, oh, no, this is the most terrible thing in the world. I can't handle it. Or that their first response is, what's their address? (laughs) I'm going to go take care of this for you, my friend. (laughs) Right. Yeah. That's. I mean, that's a human thing. I'm going to fix this for you. But to be right. able to help you bear it without trying to fix mm-hmm. it for you. Yes. That's that's a hard one, but it's, it's a good hard. one. Yes. And it's really important because like as we're adults, it's really good for us to support each other in order for you to fix your own problems. Like mm-hmm. I don't I should not have to fix everything for you. And that's hard for me as a people pleaser. I like fixing other people's problems. And it's much more fun <laughs> to fix other people's problems than to fix your own problems. <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> Mm. It totally is. But that that ability to just kind of walk with each other and be there for the person and help them hold their stuff, uh, but not not need to fix it or not take it on and break down in your own way. And then yeah. and comfort. Comfort is one of these things, too. Like, I'm going to give you a hug because I don't have a, any words to say, but I know a hug is going to at least help you kind of regulate yourself a little bit. Mm-hmm. So these are kind of like the default ones. So if somebody needs something emotionally, like this is where we kind of default to. Like when when in doubt, when someone comes to you and is dysregulated and like needs something, tune into them, validate them, comfort them, like the, those kind of actions that just make them know that they're loved and they're not crazy. <laughs> like that's kind of where we start. Yeah. And then this next quadrant, Q2, is conveying the good. <laughs> so, so these are like saying the right words in the, in the moment. So these are things like affirmation, encouragement when somebody's feeling really down and they need somebody to like speak some love to them, mm. <laughs> respect, hope, forgiveness, celebration. So these are the things that help you bring balm to people's souls. We know the power of repentance and forgiveness. So I I like to highlight that one because that's one that we as Lutherans especially really can hang on to. This this power of knowing that we can hear someone confess something, forgive them and move on to like reconciliation. But then also affirmation and encouragement are really important. I think sometimes we have a hard time, I don't know, telling people that they're doing a really good job at something. Yeah, we don't we don't want to build other people's pride or something. I don't know. But just like noticing stuff about what somebody is doing and telling them that I think is is really important to kind of help us build up these relationships in a really strong way. I love the emphasis at the end there on celebration. Yeah, that we can rejoice with those who are going through something good. I think it's our default when someone's having a really good time to well, like you're going to school. And I'm a little jealous. Like, that's my default. They're having cake. Why don't I have cake? But I think to be able to say, you have cake. I'm so happy for you. You're getting a master's in organizational leadership. I'm so happy for you. And for that to be the emotion Mm -hmm. and the, what did you call it? The good that is conveyed. And just like, let that stand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard, but it's good. Yeah. Yeah. And then Q3 is is <laughs> providing reality. So just for me personally, the the being present with people, the conveying the good, I, I got those. Like in general, oh, that's you're kind really, of, really good at that. Thoughts. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes. That's, that is my default position to like be present with people and encourage them and validate the weird stuff that they're going through and not think that it's like anything crazy or wild or like. I, I got that. Those you have a gift. It's you're <laughs> awesome at that. <laughs> Affirmation, encouragement, balm to the soul. Yes. Thanks, guys. Thanks <laughs> for the affirmation. <laughs> <laughs> See, but then we get to the other two parts, and these are, this is why I'm getting a master's yeah, well, right here. You haven't mastered it yet. So if you had it already mastered, you would pursue a different one. It's true. If you had all, if yeah. you were as good at all four quad- quadrants as you are at the first two, you yeah. would. You, they could just give you the diploma You'd be right bored. now. You'd be bored. You're well, like, and I am. Yeah, yeah, you're not bored. Yeah, I was reading the book, and we got. I got through the first two sections, and I was like, "Oh, I, I got this. I'm good." And then we got to the third one, and I was like, "Oh." <laughs> Okay, this this, this is where the work is going to happen, guys. Okay, so the third one is providing reality. 
Mm -hmm. I'm I'm okay at this one. Q4 is really where we get there. But so this providing reality space is stuff like clarification, perspective, insight, feedback, confrontation. (laughs) So and these are all supposed to be good things. So confrontation doesn't (laughs) doesn't have to be like I think we're afraid of confrontation. Yes, we are. Let's just admit it. Let's confront the reality that we are afraid of confrontation. Yeah. It's true. But these things are supposed to help us grow. And I think that's an important thing to remember when we're dealing with something that may be uncomfortable. Uncomfortable doesn't necessarily mean bad. It just means that there's like this space that we definitely need to grow and approaching it as something that is going to help us grow, I think, makes it a little bit less terrible. But like confronting the reality of something that's happening and we're doing this a lot right now in our current class of like, There's a huge benefit to appreciating the reality of a situation and just leaving it at that, like not reading into it, not thinking that the world is going to end because this is my current reality. Just like this is what is real right now and and so that you can actually deal with it. So if it is something bad that's happening, understanding that reality and having somebody maybe confront you about a reality that you're not really handling very well, maybe. It actually can be a really good thing because if you can understand what's actually happening and move through that reality to maybe have a, a better outcome to a situation instead of somebody just being like, oh, you'll be fine, even though this terrible thing is happening to you. You don't have to work on it. But actually helping other people work through hard things and maybe confronting them about the fact that this is something that you probably need to work on can be a good thing. So in our residency, we did these affirmations and challenges. And so this is kind of where this sits, where before we left, we had we sat in our group and we gave each other something that we thought they were doing really well and something we thought that they needed to work on, (laughs) which was a little uncomfortable when people are like telling you that like this is a Mm -hmm. thing I recognize in you that you probably need to work on. And it's kind of hard to hear that from people Uh that they recognize something in you that's not actually after four days. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you, this was intense. It was amazing, but oh, it was exhausting. <laughs> but mm. hearing that from other people in a way that is loving and like from people that have already attuned and affirmed and validated, like they, you know that they're, they're for you. Like, I know these people want the best for me. And yet they're still telling me like, this is something in your character you should work on. Like, I need better boundaries in my life, mm. which I knew. But other people telling me that is like, Okay, now I'm actually going to work on it because you guys have told me that I need to work on this and it's actually going to be good for me, even though it's going to (laughs) suck. Well, it's interesting that both Solomon and Plato agree that it's a mark of wisdom to be able to receive correction. Yeah. And thank the person correcting you. What we don't think of is that in order for that wise person to receive correction and be grateful for it, someone's got to offer the correction. Mm -hmm. Like I'm way more okay with being corrected than I am with being the corrector. Yeah. But in order for us all to grow in wisdom, sometimes we're one and sometimes we're the other and we got to be okay with both. Yeah. So the, there's an interesting difference too in, in these providing reality things. There's feedback and there's confrontation. And the end result of those can be kind of similar of like hearing something that you need to fix. Usually we ask for feedback though. We're like, hey, I'm working on this thing and I'm kind of struggling with it. Can you help me figure out what I'm doing? We don't generally ask for confrontation. That's something that generally somebody (laughs) recognizes needs to be fixed and like brings it to your attention without you generally asking for it. So that's an interesting difference between those two things. Mm -hmm. I think perspective, that's a really interesting area for us, especially people who kind of are good at seeing the bigger picture of things. Not everyone is good. Some people are really good at details, and that's awesome. Some people are much better at seeing big picture stuff and being able to ask those people who you know are big picture thinkers to like give some perspective on this reality. Mm -hmm. And like, what is this? If I choose this path, Mm -hmm. can you help me think through what that might look like down the road? What kinds Mm. of... What kinds of things might I run into? What kinds of uh, roadblocks am I going to come up with? Because some people are, are just better at thinking through those process kind of things. Mm-hmm. So I, th- I find that one really interesting of just like identifying people in your life who you know have this ability to maybe see things in a different way than you do and actually asking them to help you think through stuff in a way that you know you might not be able to. So, mm. all right. Call to action. 
this is the one I really need some help with. <laughs> <laughs> this is Q4. So this is stuff like advice, structure, challenge, development, and service. So these are when somebody needs to like do something and they need to be called to do something. So I spoke a little too soon. Our affirmations and challenges, that was actually in this section. But similar kind of thing that mm -hmm. this is where we're helping other people take a step. Like something needs to change. Something needs to happen. Maybe it's a change for good. Maybe it's something that they're going down a really bad path and you need to tell them, that, hey, this is going to end very badly for you and you need to do this differently. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where these fall. And this is this takes confidence in your own ability to actually like give advice like this. But there's also times when it's helpful for us to, again, recognize other people that maybe are they have wisdom in this. And mm -hmm. especially like when we talk about the body of Christ, like we have all these different generations and people with different experiences. And maybe this is a, a time when we know that something needs to change in our life. We know that maybe there's somebody 20, 30 years older than us who maybe has experienced something similar and has come out on the other end of it, asking them for advice, even if it's going to be hard to hear. Or on the flip side, if you've been through a situation and you see somebody struggling with something and you kind of have some perspective on what that is going to look like for them, being like, hey, can I give you some advice on, on what you're going through? Mm. Also notice that these are at the end of all of these different nutrients. I did this notice the that. part. Well, and that actually, that was going to be a question I had. So are these intended to be sequential? Why does it make me think of a sequential language? They're not, it's not really like you must go in order. Uh -huh. But they do kind of build on each other, if that makes sense. Okay. And it sounds like they're not meant to be done in isolation. Correct. That do not be given a call to action where you have not already and are not currently present. Yes. Or yeah. also conveying the good along with the call to action and the reality check. Right. You know, I have trouble thinking of them as sequential, although I think be present goes before all the rest. Yes. And that's kind of the this is my one like if you take away anything from this this is it mm -hmm. always start with the being present with people like mm -hmm. that is that mm -hmm. is just the default if you're not present with somebody if you're not intentionally for that person and they know that none of the rest of this is ever going to work because i you can try <laughs> but it right. may not end well <laughs> we always start in that space of being with that person and building a relationship on a solid foundation first and then all of this stuff kind of comes afterwards and there mm -hmm. i mean you can jump from being present to giving advice if there's grounds for that we just don't want to start with advice giving it doesn't <laughs> always end well and people aren't i shouldn't generalize it's a lot harder for somebody to receive advice or a challenge or a confrontation if there's nothing before it if mm -hmm. they don't know why you're coming to them with this or if there's no relationship so kind of building off of that space of having a genuine relationship with somebody and them knowing that that you're in that space with them is super important for all of the rest of them, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. There was something, I don't even think I put this in my notes, which is surprising because this was a huge thing. So there's this whole story that Dr. Townsend tells about how this person is like having a lot of trouble and she's in this weird relationship with her mom, but her dad understands her and she's fine talking with her dad, but not with her mom. And he tells the mom that that she needs to get in the well with her daughter. And so there's this whole thing that we talked about of like being in the well with the other person. But it's really helpful to think about it that way. If somebody is in this like pit of despair or like mm. just having a problem, it's going to be most helpful for that person if you're able to get in the well with that person. So you may not be able to actually do anything to help them, but just physically being there and them knowing that you're willing to experience this with them and walk alongside them is like the basis for helping other people. And that is not everyone's skill set yeah. at all. Some people are really great at advice giving or really great at the encouragement part and not really great at just like sitting there with the person while they experience what they're experiencing. Like yeah. it takes, it can take work to be that person that's just like, I am going to sit with you in this space so that you have the ability to figure it out on your own. That's hard, mm -hmm. but it's really important for people to just have that kind of relationship with other people. Yeah. Yeah, that's hard. 
but good. It's very good. Good to just like consider in your own life. And maybe you're not that person for everybody. That can be okay. Well, but I think it's something, that's something good to think about. You know, you mentioned that we have tons of friends, but that's not the same as a deep cultivated relationship. And I think the lie of the social media age is that you can have these deep, meaningful relationship with thousands of people at a, at a time. And the truth is you can't because those deep relationships, the ones where you're really present, the ones where you're in the well, they require investment of time and energy and yourself. And maybe one of the things we have to learn is to sort of be okay with that group of people. And it may, it, it may and will change. But with the group of people that we really pour ourselves into being kind of limited because yeah. we ourselves are finite. Mm -hmm. We can't have those get in the well relationships with all of our thousand Facebook friends. We just right. can't. There's mm -hmm. not enough hours in the day. Yeah. But I can have it with my husband and my children and, you know, my close friends, my church sisters, you know, yeah, you, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> But that there's there's a sort of natural upper limit, and we should not beat ourselves up about the fact that we can't have those deep relationships with everyone all at once. Mm -hmm. Not if they're going to be rich and good. I'm as my daughter's going to college now. She just went to college. Whoa. We were talking about making. I know I'm so old, <laughs> but we were talking about making friends and how it's okay, even though the RAs are telling all the freshman get out there make new friends make those Whoa. friends make those friends I mean, that's and hard. she's like but I just that's not how I work and I had to say it's okay you can have friendly relationships mm -hmm. with everyone on your floor but it's okay to wait and see who are going to be those friends that you carry with you for the next 50 years like that may might not be the first person you meet yeah mm -hmm. but that's okay yeah I think it's more important to have two or three or four really close friends mm -hmm. who kind of know everything about you than it is to have like 20 in a group, but you don't actually feel close to any of them. Because we do right. need those relationships mm -hmm. in our lives that you can tell them pretty much anything about yourself and they're going to walk with it, walk with you in whatever that is, good or bad. Mm -hmm. And that it should be more than just like you and your spouse. Like you do need other friends in your life. And I know that yeah. some people might think that's weird, but it's it's important for like married couples to also have friends that you can talk to. That is a healthy thing. And I should I should also say that, you know, when we talk about validation and affirmation especially, I think sometimes people think that that means that you have to say that the other person is right all the time, <laughs> even if you disagree with them, and that isn't that isn't what we're saying here. Like validating somebody, affirming somebody means that you are validating and affirming that what they're experiencing is actually what they're experiencing, mm. even if you disagree with them. Like there is room for disagreement mm -hmm. here. There is room for correction, for helping somebody figure out that, yes, that's what you're experiencing, but maybe that shouldn't be what you're experiencing. Maybe there needs to be some changes here. Mm. But coming that's through a great a clarification. Coming through that first, instead of trying to correct them right away, like they're not probably not going to hear you. Coming through it first is like, I hear what you're saying. I understand that this is your experience. And I believe you that this is what you're experiencing or this is what you're thinking. But maybe let's walk through it a different way or let's consider it this way or maybe think about it from this angle instead, if that makes if that makes sense. So it's it does. I think a lot of times we get into this like your truth kind of. No. Mindset and that that isn't what we're yes, doing we do, here. But let's yeah. not do that. <laughs> I mean, but uh, Sarah, I have to think that since you're doing a master's in organizational leadership, that there isn't this isn't something that's supposed to be applied to only your closest relationships. But this is a model for how you are engaging with people. Yes. Right. Like, yeah, so this is actually how you're engaging. It's not something that you would you're like, yes, I can. I can do this with the people that are closest in my life, but no, this is how I engage with the people that I am interacting with in my day-to-day -day life, in particular in the, <laughs> in the organization that I am leading. <laughs> right. And yet I would <laughs> say that if you, if you are called to a position of leadership in an organization, the people who are directly under and over you 
those have to be included in that list of, you know, 20 or so people that you can have these deep relationships with. If you're going, and I mean, not that you have to share everything with your work friends. Boundaries, we talked about yes. that. Boundaries. But at the same time, when I've been in those positions of leadership, I develop in cre- in extremely close relationships with the people that are directly under and directly over me. And that understanding how to make the most of those relationships could be really beneficial. I mean, just think about anyone you've traveled with on business and what that does oh, to your relationship with Mm -hmm. them you know what they show up to the airport in at 4 30 in the morning you know it's a it's a different kind of vulnerability there Mm -hmm. and if you're going to lead that person effectively you have to you know just be present with them at 4 30 in the morning at the airport in their whatever they're wearing so (laughs) yeah i mean this does translate to the people that you're leading like rachel is saying And it's going to look different because work relationships are different than family relationships and you don't have to tell your boss everything. But if you are leading somebody and you know that they're struggling with something, that ability to sit with them through it so that they know that you're for them so that you can help correct them in something. If if their performance fruit is not good, there's probably something going on in their character, which we haven't gotten to yet. And there's probably something in this group, these nutrients that you're going to be able to use to help them figure out why they're not performing well. (laughs) Something that Dr. Townsend says is like, when somebody's not performing well, we tend to yell at the performance of like, you're not doing this, do this better, instead of trying to understand what's going on underneath that maybe needs to be fixed first. And if that's Mm. fixed, then maybe they're going to be having better performance in whatever they're doing in work. Because a lot of the time, if something's not going well at work, there may be something underneath of like they need better support or they're having trouble at home or their kid is sick or, you know, there's something that that might be happening that needs to be addressed on a personal level Mm -hmm. and in a relational level that will then fix whatever else is happening or at least lead to a way to fix whatever is happening instead of just trying to yell at them to do better. Right. That, that doesn't always work. I, I can think of one scenario. I, I was not in the direct reporting relationship here, but I witnessed it from afar where one of the employees started being chronically late. Mm. And you could yell at her for that or you could talk to her and realize she was suffering from terrible morning sickness. And ah. maybe it wasn't going to be a permanent problem. And maybe, you know, you would rather her be late than having troubles in the wastebasket, you know, that. <laughs> yeah, right. But you can't really have that conversation if you start from an attitude of your performance is bad. Let's fix it immediately. Let's first understand the root of the problem mm-hmm. and then we can work together to try and resolve it. Yeah. So the last part of this is the trunk, the character. And we don't have to spend a ton of time here because this is going to end up being an hour, guys. I did not plan on this being an hour. This was supposed <laughs> to be a lot shorter. <laughs> Are you surprised, Aaron? No. But I only threat which is a no. <laughs> overachiever Sarah is trying not to be overachiever Sarah anymore. This is this is one of my marks of success here, guys. I have I'm going to too. what's the word? <laughs> provide reality here. Okay, so here's the thing. Aaron Aaron is my friend that I can go to to ask for feedback. Because Aaron and I are very different people and function in a different way. But I know if I need truth from somebody about what's happening, Aaron will give that to me. And that is amazing. <laughs> Real life examples here. All right. So, so character is the capacity to meet the demands of reality. So this is why we've been talking about like Ooh. reality. I know this is this is Townsend's thing. This is not my definition. This is a definition that we are all learning. I'm going to chew on that for a while. Kind of very good. I kind of like it. I don't know completely what I think of it, but I'm going to chew on that. <laughs> Most of my current class that I'm in, we are talking about this whole capacity to meet the demands of reality. It's very uh-huh. interesting, but I'm not far enough into it to like, okay. well, this is going to be long enough anyway. So we've got These four character qualities, attachment, separation, integration, and adulthood. So these are kind of the places where you learn about your character. And most people are like really good at one of them and so-so and maybe one or two Mm -hmm. and not so great in one. Because we're all just kind of built differently. So attachment, 
This is the one where you're able to build really close relationships with people. You're comfortable being vulnerable with people. You're comfortable having really deep connections with people. Not everyone is comfortable with this, of like opening up to people and talking about their feelings and emotions and, and that kind of thing. I thrive in this space. Like this is me all the way. I love talking with people and hearing about their own stuff and telling other people my stuff. So like this is my my good area. But this is just that capacity. Those really warm people like in church, we know those people who will come up to you and ask you how you're doing and just sit there and listen to you for an hour while you talk about your stuff. Like those are the people that are really good at, at this attachment thing. And this kind of is the basis for most everything in our character if we're unable to have and it starts mm -hmm. in childhood like we've all you know oh all yeah these babies. relationships yeah mm -hmm. babies and mamas this like is, that's where this it starts. is the job of a baby is to yes. attach yeah and so like in psychology and like if you go to therapy you'll end up talking a lot about attachments and like what was your childhood like did you have really mm -hmm. good relationships with your parents that kind of stuff and it's for good reason because if we're unable to have that closeness with people when we're children it's really hard for us to it takes more work to do it when we're adults and as adults, not everyone is really good at this. And so being able to kind of work on that ability to open up to people and to have these these deeper connections and talk about what's going on inside of you is, is a healthy thing to do. Even if it's not like your jam and you're never going to be super good at it, it is something that you can work on in order to kind of open up a little bit more I to be better attached. probably better at this when I was two years old than I am today. So I appreciate the challenge to yeah. revisit those early days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then separation is this ability to make up your own mind, have your own voice. This is where boundaries come in. I am <laughs> terrible at boundaries. <laughs> so I need work in this space. Some people can be very good at boundaries. Typically, this is one that, that most people need to work on in, in some form. It's hard for us to say no to people. Mm -hmm. Some people are good at it, but it's hard for us to say no. It's hard for us to be like, this is... This is where my line is and I'm just not ever going to cross it and unless there's a very specific circumstance. Because of therapy and actually because of you guys, because you guys are great at helping with boundaries, I've put in a lot of work with this over the last like year or two. Erin has been awesome at helping me with boundaries. <laughs> I would say, Erin, you're really good at this one. But that ability to like know that this is my space and this, this is the stuff that I own and over this line is your stuff and the stuff that you own and that's okay. And I can make my own choices. I can do my own things. And like there's that separation of being able to, to have that space. I think this is a very important one for us to talk about in the church. And we probably don't have time to talk about this for a long time. But we tend to overstep boundaries a lot when we're mm. talking about like service in the church. Like there's a group of people that always do all of the things and nobody else is willing to do anything. Like that's not a good thing. But that's probably also because... Some people might lack some boundaries and some ability to say no, because if I don't do it, nobody will. That's not mm -hmm. a good mindset to have. But or like, if you don't do it, somebody else will do it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So like, there's a lot of space that we can talk about this and what it means in, in our relationships in church. And, and it's very complicated, I know. But this is a very interesting one because a lot of us need some work on boundaries. And that's OK. But mm -hmm. putting that work in is, is healthy. So we don't all burn ourselves out all the time. Mm -hmm. So then we've got integration, which is this ability to work with the good realities of life and the bad realities of life together, which gets complicated pretty quickly. So like if something bad happens to me in the morning, I have the ability to not let it ruin the rest of my day because I can take it in, process it, move on mm -hmm. with that kind of thing. It's hard, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's important for us to kind of be able to recognize that good stuff, bad stuff happens and we can move on. We can process through it, acknowledge that it happens and move on. I think this fits very neatly with our theology of like sin and repentance and forgiveness mm -hmm. because we know people are going to mess up. Like that's just what happens. Mm -hmm. But how do we deal with that? How do we manage that in our own lives? Like if I sin against somebody, am I able to recognize it, repent, ask for forgiveness, receive that forgiveness and then move on to the next thing? So this is basic saint sinner simul justus mm -hmm. epicator mm -hmm. yeah. territory. Like this yep. feels this feels way more comfortable than the attachment or the separation for me. <laughs> that's, you're probably very good at this one, you and that's good. <laughs> some people are really good at just like taking it in and moving on. Mm -hmm. I need some work here. That <laughs> stuff tends to like throw my day off, so mm -hmm. I'm working on it. 
And then we have adulthood. And this is the one that, I mean, it kind of explains what it is. But this is like being responsible for your own place in the world as like your your vocation around your small place in the world. And then understanding that what you do, like you are part of the larger, like all of God's people all around the world kind of idea that we work in our small space, but we're also working on a grander scale. And where do we fit in this? Where has God called us to serve? So this gets into a lot of vocational talk and just also being able to run our own lives, manage our own things, know that we are our own people and that we have like, I am an adult and I can make this decision. Like that kind of mindset of mm-hmm. being a an individual person that is able to do things for other people. So those are your character structures. Do you guys have any other thoughts about those? I hope I become an adult someday. <laughs> Adulthood sounds great, <laughs> right? Uh, not sure why adulting gets a it gets a bad rap, but this idea of understanding your place in the world and being able to like be responsible for it and know that you're serving in your vocation successfully, mm-hmm. like that that sounds wonderful. Let's do that. It's a weirdly hard thing, right? Because it's like I oh, am yeah. I am literally an adult, and yet sometimes it blows my mind that I like own a house. Like, how did that happen? I, my daughter just went to college. I, how did that yeah. happen? Yeah. It's just, it's weird sometimes that I actually function as an adult in the world. I don't know. Anyway, so grace and truth over time. This is, this is a math equation I can get behind, guys. This is kind of just like the basis of how we're in relationship with each other. So this is kind of wrapping it all, all together. We, we start with grace when we're in relationships. Truth is important. And we talk a lot about speaking the truth in love, but that, that kind of is the same idea here that, mm-hmm. If you speak truth to somebody, which is a good thing, but you're like angry about it or you ha- <laughs> don't have a, a basis of a relationship with that person, it may not be received very well. But this idea of approaching situations with grace and with love as we understand it biblically, not necessarily how the world understands it, but that is going to be a much better space for truthful conversations to live, especially when we need to be correcting people correcting without any basis of grace behind it, mm-hmm. it won't be as fruitful and it may push people away. And this doesn't mean, again, that we're like accepting of people doing things that we know are wrong. That's a different, that is not something that we're talking about. Is then this that is, one is, because that one, then you have the lack of truth. Is that why? Like accepting when you know it's wrong, that's not, that's not truthful. That's right. It's not. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah, but I mean that's that's kind of the the love that the world will tell us that we have to give people that like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love you even though you're doing right. something wrong and that and therefore I accept you right even though I know you're doing something wrong. Like I accept you and the wrong things you're doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not I accept you but not the wrong things you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, and building a relationship so that at some point you're able to have that hard conversation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Approaching the hard conversation first without a relationship built on trust and love is, is you're getting it on 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 your head there flipping yeah. it flipping it on, on its head don't lead with that one mm-hmm. right but there is still space for that truth i think that's the whole point like it mm-hmm. is grace it is also truth like people need truth truth is good mm-hmm. but this happens over time we don't build these relationships immediately like you don't get a super close relationship with somebody in a day or two like these relationships take time in our homes and in the workplace since we're talking about organizational leadership like it is important to build these relationships based on grace and truth in the workplace as well, because when we have that, we're able to then perform in whatever that employer-employee relationship is in the best way possible. Because like we all want good outcomes if we're working nonprofit or for the church or like for a for-profit business. What like whatever you're doing, the you know the whole point is to perform well. Like that's mm-hmm. nobody wants bad performance in a business. It's not the point, but. <laughs> I'd be a little weird. But in order to have that, like the best possible way for those good outcomes to happen is if you have these relationships being based on all of these things that we're talking about. Now, some of this might be like the ideal and we're never actually going to get there because this is a lot of stuff that a lot of people would need to work on. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. But like the process of moving towards this type of relationship with people, I think is, is very important. And recognizing maybe in yourself just something like one or two things you can work on, like oh, I recognize that that's something that I maybe am deficient in. And if I work on that, maybe this part of my life might be a little easier to deal with. Just like that kind of mindset. 
that we're working on this grace and truth over time kind of relationship with people. And this underlying soil of our character where this grace and truth over time lives, like this is where we live as children of God. Like that's what this all comes back to. Mm. We are children of God. We are baptized. We are called to serve other people in our vocations. And so how do we use all of this in those vocations to serve people in the best way that we know how to? So we have a lot of areas of influence in our lives and our vocations. So how can we work on some part of that relationship to have a better relationship, be able to have better conversations, be able to have hard conversations? Because those aren't I don't like those, but they're necessary. <laughs> Just working, working on all of those spaces in our lives. So there you have it. Sarah goes to school. Yay. I'm so glad. I'm school with you. <laughs> it's going to be a good year. Yeah. Sarah goes to school and Aaron and Rachel kind of get to go to school too. <laughs> <laughs> we're, like the, we're like the younger siblings who are left at home while she goes off to school and then we get to hear all about it when she gets home. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. Well, let's see. My my current class is on character development still. So we're doing a lot of that adulthood separation, integration, attachment language and learning about character, learning about integrity, which is a very interesting wow. thing. Integrity That's is fun. awesome. I love integrity. Yes. So Especially in other people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then I do have the the company culture one, which uh, I'm I'm curious to see if I can pull out stuff from that that is interesting for our Lutheran lady audience. I think there will be. Oh yeah, we got like, a lot of leads in our group. Yeah, yeah. So the the com I think company culture is very fascinating. So it'll be fun. So those are my next two classes. So the next time we have an episode on this, it'll be probably some sort of talk about integrity and culture and working together as people. So this is fun, guys. I can't wait. Mm -hmm. And now I understand my classes better. Hey. <laughs> and I don't have to write any of your papers for you. <laughs> yeah, I will have papers to write in APA format. Help. So, okay, fine. I will be present for you <laughs> and bear your burdens with you without actually fixing your problems for you. <laughs> That's the perfect. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> I will be sending you messages. Rachel, I need validation that this is really hard. <laughs> Actually, you know what they have now that they didn't have when I was going through college and graduate school myself? Hmm. They have online citation generators. Yes. Mm -hmm. You can just plug in all the info you have in the slots and they spit out your MLA or APA or whatever citation you need. It's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some definite, there's there's some improvements that you have happened. You picked a great time to come to graphic school. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, ladies, let me know if there's anything that you found interesting or maybe challenging or you need further explanation because I didn't do a very good job explaining it in the Facebook group or on Instagram or send us an email. You can join our Facebook group, Lutheran Ladies Lounge on Facebook and follow us on Instagram at Lutheran Ladies Lounge. You can sign up for our e-newsletter in the show notes for this episode. You can send us an email, lutheranladies at kfuo.org. You can also find all of our podcasts at kfuo.org slash Lutheran Ladies Lounge or on your favorite podcasting app or on the KFUO radio app. You're listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. And I'm Rachel. Views and opinions expressed on the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO Radio, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Ladies Lounge is produced by KFUO Radio and available at kfuo.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave a review for us, too. If you love the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast, consider financially supporting our producer, KFUO Radio, so we can keep doing what we do. Find out how at kfuo.org slash give.